right, welcome to the Mac and Mike show. Today, we're going to talk to a longtime friend of mine, Brent Scott. And Brent is um, into the UFO scene. Um, we're going to do a little interview with Brent. And just starting out, Brent. Um, well, Brent's an Air Force guy. Of course, oh, he's interested in UFOs. Yeah, we didn't mention, you know, most, most of the people here are going to be veterans anyway. Um, and Brent and I were in the military together. We've known each other for 30 plus years or around there, 30 years. And we've had a lot of lively discussions on the subject. They're both Air Force and I'm the only Army guy. And that just about makes it fair. I still have the advantage, you know, but it, just having two Air Force guys and one Army guy just about makes it even for them. Yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, so, okay, so back, to the, back to the subject at hand, Brent. Um, when did you first become interested in UFO? Oh, I guess it's been about... Uh, 10 maybe 12 years now um i remember even as a youth reading a book by uh what was called chariots of the gods and can't think of the gentleman's name right von daniken yep and so that kind of sparked it i read that book probably at about nine or ten years old and there was just no interest after that and i would say about 10 12 years ago 12 years ago i guess um i saw a show that I was interested in, it's called Ancient Aliens. Uh, and they introduced an alternative perspective to our history, most importantly, our, our ancient history. And a lot of the things they were showing on there and the reasons that they arrived at the conclusions they did all, all made sense to me. So I started becoming more and more interested, watched that show for probably seven, eight seasons. And then I moved on to other things watching documentaries, uh, interviews by uh, astronauts or former military. I think of uh, Paul Hillier, who was the former uh, Secretary of Defense for Canada, who is out there uh, telling everybody who will listen that look, UFOs are real and I happen to know it. And he goes on to cite uh, all of his evidence. Uh, again, that's uh, Mr. Paul Hillier, very interesting man to be sure. Uh, as well as Dr. Steven Speer, uh, Speer uh, who's here in this country, who has briefed presidents and other uh, officials on the information that he has and knows to be true. Uh, actually, a fair amount of it through uh, the Freedom of Information Act. That, believe it or not, the government has a lot of stuff that it has already declassified. And, well, it's quite interesting, to say the least. You mean they have stuff they haven't told us? No, Brent, I'm not. Yeah, you never going to do that to us. Do we, do we need to establish that UFOs stand for unidentified flying objects? That, I mean, yeah, and the new term is UAP, unidentified aerial phenomena. Yes. And then we have the underwater type. I forget what the acronym is. USOs. USOs, yeah, unidentified submerged. Well, just so everybody knows, we're talking about stuff that. Uh, the military and civilian governments cannot understand and they they in not being able to classify it as being a a uh, an object that is earthly in nature um that even from one of our contemporary potentially opposing na national powers we're we're not sure what they are just so everybody's on the same page yeah and um interestingly enough i was i'm i think what am i nine years older than you brent so I read the same books as you. Um, I read Chariots of Gods, Gods from Outer Space, all by Von Donneken when I was much older than you were. You said you were nine. I was probably 16, maybe 20. And uh, then I remember investigating it. And um, the, the first term I ever heard was pseudoscience about that. And the big proponent was, um, who's the guy that did the show? Billions, Carl Sagan, Carl. billions and billions of years ago. You know, he sort of shredded Eric Von Donneken. However, like me. But I might uh, add, if I may, prior to that, he, he was fully in favor of the UFOs. Well, no, he always he always was and still was. He just said that the correlation that um, the guy was drawing between ancient artifacts and UFOs was pseudoscience. Oh, now, Carl see. Sagan, of course, believed that all kinds of life could exist in our universe. And he never wavered from that. And of course, I'm a little bit different than Sagan. I, I modify it a little bit. I think life could exist. I'm not quite sure 
that it does because I view these things more in a dimensional way than I do in an intergalactic way. And I have a lot of reasons that you and I have discussed over the years about that. But uh, yeah, I remember when uh, the show Ancient Aliens started coming back to TV and I, I, I remember distinctly thinking, this was all discredited back in the 80s and 70s. How could they bring it back? And I think I shared with you Ancient Aliens debunked. It's, a, it's an hour and a half or so, maybe a two hour video on YouTube. And you and I have gone back and forth. Like, I believe UFOs exist. I mean, the Pentagon released video of it. You can't really deny that UFOs exist. It's just what they are and how many of the stories that we hear can we believe? Well, I'm, I'm not into it as much as you guys are. And, and being Air Force, I understand you guys are probably closer to it than I. Um, but I think it's pretty arrogant of human beings to assume that we're the only intelligent life that exists. I mean, um, if, if, if this, you know, if this is as good as it gets, you know, we're maybe we're all in trouble. So I, I, it's not inconceivable that there is intelligent life forms that exist either within our galaxy or in other galaxies. I mean, let's just face it, it you know, there is a God who, who created all things. And um, if, if he created this galaxy, is it, is it impossible to accept that he created other galaxies with, with other life forms that are intelligent, top of the food chain? Of course not. Yeah, when it comes to, to uh, saying about God, it, a lot of the things you mentioned, Brent, were from the Bible. Um, Ezekiel's wheel within the wheel, uh, chariot of fire that took away, who was it, Elijah or Elijah? Elijah. Yeah, and we had an and interesting- the book of Enoch. And the book of Enoch. So, so we had interesting discussions about that. Uh, I think one of the main points you brought up is the way people would view that. How did you say back in the day? Because they had no reference point. Go ahead. Yes, well, it. I'd heard this. Uh, it, quite possibly, it was misunderstood technology. Now, try to put yourself, gentlemen, 3,000 years ago. Maybe you're Ezekiel. How would you describe a, a UFO? other than you'd have to use your vocabulary, right? He didn't have the term UFO, but all he knew at that time was there was this huge wheel within a wheel in the air. Of course, we hear about rumblings and the ground trembled and so forth. A lot of things that happen when a rocket takes off. Uh, we, we see that even today, like with, you know, the space shuttle took off and so forth. Uh, acrid smells of, uh, of fuel, which one might describe as maybe sulfur or sulfurous, uh, if, if that's the only word you have to describe it. Uh, the ground trembling, uh, the roaring of many waters. Uh, in other words, there was a lot of noise. And so for me and, and others out there, I take a look at that from an objective, uh, shall we say, non-spiritual aspect. And just look at the, just look at the text for what it is, text. I have a tough time believing that what he was seeing was not, in fact, what you and I would call a UFO. Uh, I think, of course, two of, uh, I believe it was Elijah. Yeah, it was, it was an Enoch. Forgive my memory here. But one of them was taken away in a chariot of fire. Well, chariot would denote some kind of vehicle because that was the only vehicle they had at that time were chariots. A chariot of fire. Well, was he maybe describing uh, a, a rocket engine? Was he maybe describing that, I don't know, there were a lot of lights around it? You know, I'm just try to put yourself for a moment in the author's place. And 3,000 years ago, how would you have described something that, that as, as we just talked about, we don't understand? Well, how in the world would they have understood it? Well, you know, Brent, be, before you get too deep into this, into this hole, sure. You, you understand that those words, especially those words written in the Bible, um, they, they were meant from a very religious perspective. And from that very religious perspective, if you have a God and a God is all powerful and has no limitations, then certainly whatever they tried to describe in those biblical passages could be the work of God, some sort of miracle that they didn't understand either. I mean, I, I don't have any problem if, if, if you read it in that context um, of potentially being something that was um, uh, uh, related to aliens from 
another time or another planet. But, you know, then what you need to do is you need to ask for proof, right? I mean, if, if, if something tangible physically happened, unless it were a miracle, in my, in my opinion, you, you, you offered yours, unless it were a miracle, there should be some sort of tangible remnant, some sort of evidence of that physical thing. Would you, would, would you accept that? Uh, yeah, I accept the premise, absolutely, but who's to say it isn't there? You know, you're, you're right. Your, your premise could be just as right as mine is. I'm, I'm not suggesting oh, mine is superior to yours. I'm, I'm just saying that, it, it, in my opinion, your suggestion that it was ancient aliens would indicate to me that there would be some sort of tangible evidence. That's all I'm saying. And I don't know that any tangible evidence exists. That's, again, uh, uh, you know, uh, if something spiritual happens, and again, I, I'll use the word miracle. And, and I know there are a lot of people that are not religious and, and they're not gonna they're not gonna accept my explanation either. And that's okay. Um, but in 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 the realm of a miracle, just as difficult to explain or to understand or to accept as your explanation, um, there would be no physical evidence, right? I mean, potentially would it, it, that's what miracles are. Um, if an ancient alien or a visitor from another planet or another solar system or another galaxy visited the United States, would there not be some sort of physical, tangible evidence? You know, when, when who was it, Cortez and all of it, you know, they came, they, they left breastplates behind and helmets and stuff. And, you know, there was, there was a sign that they were there, right? Um, there's no signs to my knowledge, and maybe you have something you can share with me, there's no physical evidence that of some sort of ancient alien being here, right? Well, I'll chime in, and it's if it's okay, Brent, um, you are the guest. Uh, but oh, you know, we all watch Tucker Carlson, and he has segments on UFOs from time to time. You know, he's pretty open-minded yeah. about that. And one of the things that he brought to light recently that really intrigued me is there are rumors underfoot, and again, they're rumors, but Tucker doesn't usually traffic in things that aren't pretty substantiated rumors. In other words, more than one source that we have collected something from what we would call an identified flying object. And it has to be analyzed and they've already sent it supposedly to its first analysis. And of course, anytime in the scientific community, when you, when you analyze something, you can't just analyze it one time and say, okay, this is the answer. So it's, it has to be sent to multiple labs. And because the government doesn't have the capability of our private sector, they had to sign private sector companies to non-disclosure agreements and have it analyzed. And the first preliminary results are supposedly done. And what Tucker said is those preliminary results say that this material is definitely not of this earth and the reason for that is it seems to have been constructed on the quantum level. Now, what that means is we have been working to do this kind of thing on the quantum level ourselves. We are not there yet. And quantum is below subatomic. So we try to create these really small robotic things and get neutrinos and things to interact with the parts of electrons to almost come together to make something. And we could go a lot deeper into this, um, but I've also thought that one of the first ways that we as explorers with the technology that we're looking at ourselves and where it might be shortly could go is remote viewing. Because we know Einstein discovered, um, you know, spooky action at a distance is what he called it, where electrons can be here and halfway across the universe simultaneously and we can entangle them. So theoretically, we could almost build something at a distance instantly, and we could almost be present there, but it's not really us. It's something we've built. That's all based on science. This is not science fiction. Uh, we're yes, working, we're CIA, working uh, towards that. The CIA had a, a huge program. I don't know that they do now. It's 50s and the 60s. Uh, you can Google a gentleman by the name of Ingo Swan, and he was a remote viewer, in fact, for the CIA, looked at 
Russian stuff, looked at the dark side of the moon, etc. I'll, I'll let you arrive at your own conclusions with his story. Uh, but remote viewing, I believe, is, is a very real uh, aspect uh, of science. Um, I, might, I might also uh, revert back to something that Max said uh, when you were talking about a God that is omnipotent, you know, can do anything, is everywhere, etc. My question about that is, okay, let's say he is, he's everywhere. Why does he need a chariot of fire to get around the universe? And so to me, that, in my mind, that kind of nullified that because the, uh, I happen to believe in a higher power myself and happen to believe that he is uh, omnipotent, uh, as, as you described. And it just doesn't make any sense in my finite mind why a being so powerful that created, you know, 100 billion galaxies or the universe needs a, a Volkswagen to get around the universe in. That yeah, made no yeah. sense to me. Well, I, I don't I don't want you to interpret what I said as, as him crawling into a Volkswagen to come to Earth. Um, you know, you suggested that Enoch got into a chariot of fire. Right. And what I'm saying is, is that much like, um, you know, Moses, in his words, described a burning bush. Um, you know, what what was it that he described as a burning bush? Do you think it really was a burning bush? Uh, or, or, or was it something else? And, you know, if, if, if God was going to physically remove a human being from the earth, not someone who died and was buried and spiritually left the earth, but, but a human body that left the earth, how would God do it? Um, and is it not possible, as you explained, there would be some sort of flash of light? And isn't that flash of light just as possible to be called the chariot of fire as as you described the ancient alien being and you know again neither one of us will have proof for that um i just it's again it seems to me and maybe mike's explained it maybe we do have identifiable material um you know i know that we have uh you know generation six fighter jets that we've never seen and i know that i'm suspect that other nations, China specifically, may have technology that rivals ours, maybe in some, some ways is superior to ours. I know their Navy is larger than ours and they have more satellites. I mean, I know specifically that they sent killer satellites up into, the, uh, up into orbit so that it can take out our satellites in case there's a war between our countries. So their technology that they're using is, we've not, the United States has not admitted to having any satellites that are capable of taking down other satellites. I assume we do. Any prudent nation would would want to protect itself from another nation like that. But, you know, Alan McCormick, Mac, has not seen any tangible evidence that says, you know, these were ancient aliens. Now, I can't show you tangible evidence of God either. OK, so, you know, we, we could we could clearly debate that. I think it was I think it was Einstein, but I'm, I, I don't want to get the quote wrong. I, I think it was Einstein who said, all you need to do, to do is look at the order of the world, the order of the planet, and how all things work in concert with one another. And there can be no, you can arrive at no other conclusion other than intelligent design. So do I believe that there was a God that created the heavens and the earth? I'm not alone in thinking that. Uh, as a matter of fact, that was the predominant theory of people that, you know, founded this nation and, and those that created science. I mean, we've come a long way from when the church didn't want Galileo to do his, his scientific studies. Yeah. Can I or put Bruno to death for even introducing the idea that there was more than us? Right. We burned him alive at the stake just for saying it. Yeah. I think that's I think that was a little extreme. Well, every, there's been a lot of extreme history. I do want to, before we move on, though, um, mention in relation to what Alan just said, is it was the Chinese who in the last few years were the first country to successfully entangle uh, at the quantum level particles on the Earth and particles on a satellite. And the first time they did that, they entangled from Earth to the satellite successfully. And then about a year later, they were able to successfully entangle the particles from the satellite to earth. Now, we had entangled particles long before that, but not at such great distance. And the first application 
of this quantum entanglement will be for secure communications. That's just a little side note scientifically that's quite interesting. I'm glad you brought that up. Well, I would, I would suggest- Just you, for just a moment, if, if we're there doing that as you, the human race, fell out of if we're there doing that, can you imagine quite possibly the technology that another civilization might have that's been around for let's say a million years longer than us? Oh yeah. It would seem, in my opinion, to someone who witnessed that in, in an archaic era, who might have witnessed that technology, mistook it for something divine. Rather, all it was was misunderstood technology. Again, they had no idea what they were seeing, so naturally they would attribute it to the divine. But I might also add, the Bible is not the only ancient text that talks of cities in the sky like right. uh, the ancient Sumerians did, right? Uh, to name to name just one other. The Hindus. Uh, the, we also have yeah. aerial flight being described in the Quran. Mm -hmm. Magic even, carpet I, ride. Memory serves even in the Torah. So it's not like the Bible is the only text that 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 shows those possibilities. And so, with such a common thread that has spun down through thousands of years, it makes me wonder. So everybody made up all these stories? No, Brent. It, it's just a question yeah, I'm asking. You know, it, it, and, and look, I'm not trying to make light of, 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 of what you're saying, but you know, in each of these occurrences, in each of these religious texts, you're suggesting it may be ancient aliens or you know, some sort of uh, you know, highly developed uh, being from, from somewhere other than the earth. And I don't, I, I cannot dispute that because I don't have em, em, empirical data or proof that says, no, you're wrong. The only question that doesn't lead me to accept that is, is that if we had visitors to this planet from somewhere other than this planet, that it seems to me that there would be some physical evidence that they left behind. Hell, when I go on vacation, I sleep stuff in the, in the hotel room all the time. And, sure. you know, and, and I don't mean to equate myself with the, with the ancient aliens that potentially visiting the earth. Maybe they're a little bit more circumspect, a little bit more <laughs> um, careful in, in not leaving things behind. All I'm saying is, is that um, I accept the deity be, on faith. And I understand that because I accept the deity on faith, that you can poke holes in that in that explanation. And the old saying, to those who believe no proof is necessary, to those who do not believe no proof is possible. So, and maybe that applies to both my theory of the chariot of fire or the magic carpet ride or any of these other things that you and yours um, are, are, are both the same. You know, it's kind of interesting as we're talking about this, we're using this green screen thing and <laughs> it works really well if I shoot us in quick time but this is a Zoom conversation. And you notice we have a microphone that just almost fell off a table. You can't see the table either. And when we move in and out, you can see oh. all kinds of, you know, it's missing. And yes. that kind of goes to the next subject, which was, uh, you know, video evidence and photographs and things of that nature. So just by seeing this alone, it's a good object lesson that you can do a lot with video and we've been able to do that for a long time. So modern video evidence of UFOs doesn't convince me personally, me personally of anything. Of anything. Um, there was recently a UFO sighted over LA and they had it on video and it was really cool and all that. Turned out to be an LED lit kite being flown off the back of a boat over the bay. Oh, so, okay. but you know, it was all on the news. It's like, look at this UFO. And it's like, yeah, you have to wait a couple of days and they figured out what it was. But uh, those sightings always leave me cold, as you said. But you, the ones that 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 make me question the existence of, of these UFOs, is, you know, when we have Air Force and Navy pilots that are flying our most sophisticated flying machines, the jets that they're in, the, the war machines that they're in, and they see something in the sky that that violates all of the norms of flight as we understand it. Those guys are, you know, in the top physical and mental shape uh, of their lives. Um, they're, they're highly trained in the, you know, aeronautics and, uh, and the nature of aeronautics and in uh, observation. 
Yeah, and 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 they see something that they cannot qualify, quantify, or put into a certain category, then you got to say to yourself, how do you, how do you not give that eyewitness some level of credibility, right? Well, let's, okay, eyewitness testimony. We just talked about this the other day, didn't we, Brent? Yeah. Um, it's interesting that eyewitness testimony is relied upon in a court of law and given the most weight when it comes to whether we convict somebody. In the science realm, Eyewitness testimony is given what percentage of credibility? Zero. Because scientifically, we know eyewitness testimony is the least reliable in, this, in the sciences. We see things all the time that aren't true. We have to develop special instruments just to see infrared and other wavelengths of light. And we can't even see the radio waves that are all around us, you know? So, you know, just eyewitness, what our senses can draw in is absolutely meaningless. Um, you have to have replicatable experiments in the scientific community. But I just thought that was a good place to interject again, that little tidbit of truth. Yes, absolutely. Well, um, we talk about eyewitness testimony, um, but what if, what if you actually saw one? I don't know if you ever actually have. Um, I have seen something myself that that I couldn't explain, that defied all of the laws of physics that I understand. Um, and I'm certainly not the only one. Uh, someone saw it with me, quite frankly. Um, I don't, I don't purport uh, anything other than what you said. That scientifically, you know, eyewitness testimony, you know, is, is given very little value, but that doesn't nullify what the people claim they saw. No, you can't argue with somebody's experience. That's that's the other truth. Like, you know, if you experienced it, to you, that's going to be true regardless. And whether it was real or not, nobody can actually challenge that unless they were there. But again, it falls into outside evidence. Um, it could be, I guess, you know, we could get all wonky here and get into inductive versus deductive reasoning and how you build on something until you arrive at a conclusion. One of the things I like about Mike is we look at things so differently. You know, Mike's always looking at this, you know, like the philosophical and, you know, educational, and he's taking it levels up here. I Me, mean, I'm the guy that's drinking a beer at a bar. And I, you know, like the question that, 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 that runs headlong into me is, okay, let's say for a minute that what Brent is talking about, what Brent saw was some sort of intelligent life form not of this planet. What Brent saw was some sort of physical, tangible vehicle, space vehicle, some sort of ability, whether it was, it, you know, it was distant viewing or whatever it was. What if what Brent saw was real and tangible? Now the question that comes into my mind is, what do we do about it? You know, what, what are the, what concerns should we have? What possibilities do we have to investigate further and maybe even more important than either of those if what Brent saw was real is it friendly or unfriendly and what sort of threat does it pose to our, our world our, our nation our society my grandchildren you know what I mean um, as, as long as it doesn't you know, is, is it an immediate, clear and present danger, as they say? Do I need to worry about it? There's intellectual curiosity, of course, but um, you, either you have answers to all those questions? Well, my particular viewpoint on as far as what we can do about it is absolutely nothing. I mean, if, if these beings, let's say, have been around long enough to figure out how to keep a large object aloft without propulsion that you and I understand um, if it were to come down to it, what possible hope would we have uh, that's why I'm inclined to think that if <laughs> there are beings visiting here and so forth that that they're not hostile because it would seem to me if they were they, they could have not only could they have taken over the world 3,000 years ago if they wanted to but they could certainly do it today because to the best of my knowledge we don't have anything, although there's rumor that uh, 
a vehicle called the TR-3B, uh, which came from uh, UFOs that have been caught, studied at the uh, at Area 51. Uh, that in fact, there are UFOs that they make and there are UFOs that we make. So even within the context of the story I just shared with you, I don't know that there were aliens in there. Could have been a colonel and two privates for all I know. No, it could have been a mechanical or a robotic or some type of life form that we might not even understand as life. I mean, we're carbon-based life forms and you know, I've read a lot of science fiction. Science fiction is one of the great loves of my life. I wanna write a science fiction book someday, maybe with collaboration here with you guys. Um, but yeah, I mean, it could, there, there could be silicone life. We, we are on the verge of creating quantum computers along with artificial intelligence. We could theoretically send intelligent nanobots all throughout the universe. And, you know, then we get into the Fermi paradox and that, that kind of thing. So there's a lot of interesting things to discuss in relationship to this subject. Of course, uh, a plethora of different directions we could go through, but I'm, I'm flattered and I'm honored that uh, you guys chose to interview me for this. It's a subject that I've long considered dear. And I want to put a uh, caveat out there for, for others who, who may think along these lines. Uh, in, in my assertions of, of things unworldly, I don't in any way mean to demean, denigrate, or otherwise modify uh, scriptures, whatever they may be, that people hold dear. I'm not here to attack religion or yeah. philosophy by any means. Do. Nor do I do. I think I, I didn't interpret it that way, Brent. I okay. didn't. If I, I, I just came to across that way, yeah. I can do that. Yeah. Or it seems like that way. And I just want to do. I apologize if that's the way it came across. No, I look, brother, I don't know. Okay. And, and, and your, where your, you know, intelligence based on experience has led you to the solution or the answer that, that you have arrived at. You know, I've not I've not arrived at the same area, and I, I know this is maybe splitting hairs. But to me, if it were if if these things were explained by a miracle by God, then I don't have to look for evidence because I wouldn't expect to find evidence. When I look at these instances and I say that they are they are they're the result of some sort of extraterrestrial or some sort of intelligent life form not of this planet. Uh, whether that be, you know, silicone based or, or mechanical or whatever Mike's talking about. I just, I don't understand why there wouldn't be some sort of tangible physical evidence that was left behind, whether that's because there was an accident, whether that's because they just accidentally left it, you know, it, it that's, that's where I would, my logic tells me that if those kinds of things occurred, and you, and you may be right, you know, maybe it's maybe it's stuck in Area 51 and, and nobody's telling us about it. And I, I certainly believe that's possible because once upon a time, I believe that my government shared almost all the righteous things with me. I'm not so sure that I believe everything the government says today. Yeah, yeah I, I, I will admit myself that uh, I kind of grew up really not trusting government. And it wasn't because of anything uh, that I was taught by my parents. It was just seeing things on the news and, and other aspects where I'm thinking, wait a minute, what, but, but they said this last week, or they said this last year, etc. And if one is willing to accept the premise that UFOs exist, and if one's willing to accept the premise that the government doesn't tell us anything, then why is it impossible to believe that there is a concerted effort to keep the truth from not just the American people, but from people, well, uh, the human race, if you will. I mean, I think of things like the rumored uh, Majestic 12 that was uh, formulated by, uh, uh, I believe it was President Truman. Uh, yeah. In the same year, he signed the National Security Act in which he greatly limited our ability to, to question things. Uh, it's been told by people who have encountered uh, military people who intimidated them or whatever you know to them oh it's a matter of national security keep your mouth shut well back in the day if the government told you to keep your mouth shut you did it yeah in the interest of national security right 
I'm not so sure that wasn't just a, a great big piece of wool being pulled over all of our eyes. Well, you and I, well, I was going to say, we have all been in the military. You and I were Air Force. You were in special ops with me for a while. And I've said this, the one thing I, I typically believe is that people can't keep a secret. I mean, you know, I, how many times did you receive a, a classified briefing? And by the way, I was in operations. So I worked with those pilots, you know, like you were in maintenance. So you didn't have as much. So everyone holds pilots in a lot higher regard than I do. You know, I'm, I'm sorry. I knew these guys firsthand, a bunch of drunks, a bunch of womenizers, you know, a bunch of storytellers. Uh, but that's sort of getting sidetracked. They did in, ask. In order to get into that airplane, they have to have a certain level of intelligence. They, 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 didn't, do. they didn't get in there because they're, you know, they're digging ditches. Yeah, well, that's true. I, I agree. You know, I agree. Was, I thought I could handle an airplane too, but <clears throat> it's really, it's, it's mechanical. One of our best pilots was a surgeon in real life. So it's kind of, he had steady hands. Um, but he said, you know, it's not that I'm that smart. I just persevered. So we were good friends. That so was Jack. Anyhow, um, where was I going with this? Except that generally and by and large, and, and Mac or Alan has this saying, all generalities are false, including this one. Yeah. And this generality is people typically can't keep a secret forever. Now, in, in my 23 years in the military, I will say that there is one thing, one mission that I went on, that I signed paperwork to with, you know, threat of eternal punishment in prison and isolation. And to this day, at 63 years old, there are two words before I die that I'm going to type into a Google search that I would never do, not even to this day. And I have kept my mouth shut. I've, I can say that much about it. But on most other missions we were on, people, word gets out. Now, yeah. Brent, you pointed out when we had this discussion, a good point, and you pointed out that what, the skunk works that or when they were building the nuclear bomb, how many thousands of people were keeping this secret for how long? Yeah, thank you. Uh, over 100,000 people worked on the atomic bomb issue. Manhattan Project. Over a thank you. And it was 10 years prior to us yeah. bombing Japan, 10 years. Nobody said a word. Now, granted, I, I don't think our lackadaisical security that Khrushchev told us he would defeat us through can be compared to the generations prior who actually took security seriously. Sure. Loose right? lips and ships, we, World War II. Right. And, yeah. and they believed that absolutely. And, yeah. and, and I did too. Uh, but I would, I would discuss things with Mike, I'll admit, that maybe I shouldn't even have discussed, and I don't think vice versa, but I'll cop to it. Um, but Brent, that's you, me. The, the, the question you asked, and we kind of went on a tangent, the question you asked was, is it impossible to believe? And, and the direct answer, the short and direct answer is no, it's not impossible to believe. It, you, you, everything that you've suggested could absolutely be right. I, I just don't know. And I don't want to come across as being the naysayer. And I certainly don't want to, you know, you said you don't want to denigrate or, or put down anything that, uh, about the scriptures, nor do I want to uh, suggest in any way, shape or form that the conclusions you've arrived at could not be 100% accurate. Um, the, the, the only, again, where I have difficulty is, is that in, in you know, to my, you know, Mike mentioned that one of my, gener the thing about generalities that I say all the time, well, the, the, the other one that I say all the time is logic is the bane of my existence. When you have a logical mind, everything has to be logical. If it's not logical, it doesn't make sense. And if it doesn't make sense, then I have to go and investigate it. And, and that's, just the, that's just the way my brain is and the way I live. And, and let me tell you, it is absolutely the bane of my existence. I, I see something illogical and I can't let it lay. I've got to understand it. So everything you've said is possible. There's no doubt. It, you know, there's nothing I have, nothing that I can say that would make it impossible. The only, the only, the only critical doubt that I can, I can generate is if 3,000 years ago up till today, uh, we had visitors from some other dimension, some other planet, some other galaxy, some other life form. Um, you would think that accidentally or purposefully that there would be some sort of tangible evidence. And, and the answer may be the tangible evidence existed 
or does exist, but it's just kept hidden from us. And, 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 and that's, a, that's an acceptable answer for a guy who lives in the world of logic. Yeah, okay, so I'll bring up one last subject. And I think we're only able to record 40 minutes worth of this, so we may have to stop and then start over again. Are we close to 40 minutes? I think, well, I think so. I think Mike, you got to quit talking so much. We're 31 minutes. Um, well, Brett and I have discussed these things for, what, years now? Yes. And uh, sometimes it's gotten rather heated and it's like, man, I don't <laughs> want to lose a friend over this. Never but happened. One of, the, one of the conclusions that I came to is we all come at this from different personality perspectives. Yeah. Like you said, logic is the bane of your existence. One of the things that I came to the conclusion of between Brent and I is there are those who want to believe. And there was a time in my life I wanted to believe. And now my personality is that I want to know the truth. And, and these are not diametrically opposed. There's this whole spectrum sure. between those two feelings. But by and large, I want to know the truth. By and large, I think, not to speak for you, Brent, but you have a preponderance to want to believe because I'll analyze both sides and I'll take both sides very seriously. And then I'll apply the bane of Alan's existence, which is logic, which I love. And I just, I've always said that it, these kinds of is issues are that you can't prove are probability based. Yeah. You know, like I, I say, okay, I lean 70% towards ancient aliens had nothing to do with building the pyramids. It didn't mean there weren't aliens or something around at that time in our history, because we know there is a phenomena that occurs today. I mean, the Pentagon released it. You can't, you, they're not denying it. They're not saying they know what it is, but when the Pentagon at least admits this, and it was first broken on Tucker Carlson, um, that you have to admit unidentified aerial phenomena exists. We can go down a whole nother road in the next segment, which would have to do with interdimensionality, which is uh, curious and- uh, That would be another 40 minutes. That'll be close <laughs> to 40 minutes. I, I understand. Well, so, I, I can tell you gentlemen that uh, reputable testimony is out there and there is evidence. Uh, I would ask you to look at the sayings of uh, Neil Armstrong, Buzz Aldrin, uh, Cooper, to name just a few. They all speak of alien life. They all speak of UFOs as if they are real. Yeah. Uh, why would they do that? Why would you rise to the pinnacle of your career, become an astronaut, only to destroy it by saying UFOs exist? That makes no sense to me. No, it doesn't. It has no logic to it. No. Uh, well, let, let me dispute a little bit of that really. right now. I look, and I'll add something in the video. Look a little bit more deeply into exactly what they did say. And I'll put some links up in the video at the time. But yeah, I've heard that a lot too. And but you, but you're making a general good point. Like there are pilots, there are many people. There's one just on the news last week where I think a pilot going from, was it Utah to LA or something? Radioed in. I mean, this thing came right overhead. It was like, no, sh no kidding. I was about to say a bad word, but um, you know, he said, no shit. I guess we can bleep that. And it, I believe he really saw something, you know? Absolutely. So. And as, as Mac alluded to before, you know, these, these people are trained observers these people are the cream of the crop as far as de despite what you described as maybe uh poor officer type behavior i'm, I'm just the, i'm just <laughs> razzing in case some of the pilots are listening to this <laughs> hey all i, I know I, is top tom cruise on top gun he was not like that at all <laughs> yeah <laughs> well at any rate and as i alluded to dr paul hillier i think of also luis elizondo who ran the eight tip program for the government he's out there talking about it um there's the gentleman from uh i can't think of his name but he's the former lead singer for blink 182 yeah. who works in conjunction with these people there's that top I mean, guy why would you waste Britain? your personal fortune on something that isn't real that makes yeah. no again there's yeah. no logic to that right like i there's that i forget the guy's name from great britain he's very very impressive yeah but he he doesn't advocate all the way he just says there's something to this and we should be concerned and we and should for, investigate, you know, for those that deny they're full of, you know, you know what baloney yeah. baloney. That's the word I'm struggling to find. And, you know, for those that are all bought in to conspiracy theories, well, that that's another extreme. 
So if, I we think take we have this, to... if we take this much longer, we're going to lose our audience completely. Okay. Brent, so... <laughs> thanks so much for being on the Mac and Mike show today. Thanks for bringing this subject to our, to our podcast, our video blog. And I'm sure that there are many people who are going to find it interesting. And those that don't, won't watch it. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So thanks a lot, Brent. Um, Thank we'll you both. Touch. It was an honor. Thank you very much. You have a great day, brother.